I'm Nancy Heal. I'm the director of the Book Arts Center here at Wells College. And I'm going to introduce our speaker, Sarah Bryant, who is our sixth Victor Hummer Fellow. The Victor Hummer Fellowship was begun in 1998, and the first fellow was Jocelyn Webb, who came here to a building that had a couple of presses, a bunch of mismatched type, uh, board sheer, I'm trying to think, Chris, do you remember what all there was? Not as much as we have now. And she set out teaching letterpress printing, which happened at that point, the fellowship was one course per semester, but the student need, hi Emily, but the student needed to be, um, the student, the fellow needed to be producing work of his or her own. And Jocelyn set a very wonderful standard that all of our fellows have matched in their tenure here as the Victor Hummer Fellow. Sarah is our sixth Victor Hummer Fellow. She has the MFA from Alabama, Tuscaloosa, where there is a wonderful book arts program. It's part of the MFA. It has other words, library, MFA program in... Oh, it's in the library school. It's in the library school, but it's the MFA program in book arts. And um, Sarah had been coming to Wells for a couple of summers before we hired her. And so I, unfortunately, I had to go to Spain almost every summer. And so <laughs> I never met Sarah when she was here for her summer visits, but I always heard about this wonderful person, Sarah. Can you believe the stuff that she's doing? Oh, you didn't meet her, what a shame, because she's really doing this marvelous stuff. And then when she was one of our candidates for the sixth Victor Hummer Fellowship um, I was really thrilled because everybody around me already knew who she was and what kind of fabulous work she does. She was, Sarah was teaching in Italy when we had a phone interview with her about the job. And she was teaching in Italy on the Georgia program, yeah. was it? In Cortona, Italy, teaching book arts. That's a tough position, too, to have to be in Italy for a semester teaching book arts. But we had a great conversation on the phone, and I could tell that, indeed, all the great things I had heard about her were really true. She's so enthusiastic, so organized, so creative, and she has just a craziest sense of humor, which just fits me to a T. So we've been like bosom buddies ever since she got here. Um, and today we were sharing pickles at the Fargo. I was just horrified thinking, George must think we have no table manners, but we were just watching, switching food back and forth across the table. Sarah has been a wonderful, wonderful colleague, um, a wonderful artist, a wonderful teacher for our students, a mentor for our interns and our um, one student who's doing an individualized major in the book arts. She's just fabulous. And she's going to talk to you now about the latest book that she's made, which when you start looking at the process involved, you will agree it's just an astonishing endeavor, and it is so gorgeous, so gorgeous, that private collectors across the country are buying it up because it, it's just unusual and fabulous. So, did I say fabulous yet? <laughs> yeah. Here's our fabulous Victor Hammer Fellow, Sarah Bryant. Thank you. That was very nice. It makes me embarrassed. Um, uh, uh, before I start, I, I just wanted to say, can you, you can all hear me okay, right? Um, I want to say thank you for this. this. These three years here have been wonderful, really. And I, I've been able to do so much work. My students have been fantastic. Um, and uh, Nancy Heal, oh, it makes me sad to say goodbye. <laughs> so anyway, Nancy Heal, by the way, we should all be thanking because she's been keeping the center together with just sheer force of will. So thank you. Um, so um, I'm really glad to have the chance to talk to you about this book. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I've been working on this for a lot of the time that I've been here, for most of the time that I've been here, and I finally finished binding it about two or three weeks ago. So it's uh, it's a good you know it's a good feeling. Got a little tendonitis, but I'm doing okay. Um, and it's also nice to talk about the process because, in, in fact, I think generally when you're making a book, even though the process of making that book is about 150% of what you're doing, you're also working very hard to hide that process from anyone who might be looking at the book. I don't want people to look at my work and say, oh, look, she made it by hand. 
you know, or, oh, I can see all of those early bad decisions she was making in the beginning. So I want to share them with you now, but I, I'm really excited to have a chance to talk about something that usually is hidden and that I enjoy a lot. Um, but I want to start by giving you a quick look at some of the other books I did leading up to this project. Um, so we shall begin with this. This is um, called The Index. It's a book from 2006. I guess I say that up there. Um, a lot of the work that I have done up until this point um, is generally about what, how we describe what is hidden, you know, or what is underneath things. Um, and so a good place to start for me was making a, a skeleton book. I think everyone should make a skeleton book. This is a, a kind of a self-portrait. Uh, it unfolds to five foot six feet tall. And it's called the index because you can see printed along the side is actually an anatomical index of the human body boosted from some <laughs> something or other. I think it was a Mosby's anatomical atlas. Uh, I removed all of the diseases, which is actually more difficult than you'd think. It's all in Latin. And uh, I had a medical proofreader help me kind of pick through to find you know, which were actually appropriate parts for a female body. Um, and I know a lot of them, but I needed some help. And, uh, and here's this book. Um, what part of the process, a part of this book is hidden when it's folded up and revealed when it's unfolded, so there you go. Um, this is a, a, a book I did the year later uh, called Cutaway, which for me was kind of a playful book about how we use the same visual language and um, verbal language to describe simple objects. A lot of these definitions can be kind of shifted a little bit and they still seem to describe the same things. Words like earth and apple and shell each have about 10 sub-definitions that are so broad it's like reading poetry. Uh, and so I, I made a kind of a playful game of a book where you're peeling apart these images of simple objects, the definitions are shifted throughout and these cards kind of come out. And these translucent layers pair up um, objects that didn't have a relationship before, but suddenly do. Um, this book uh, similarly uses structures that help you kind of dissect objects, but in this case I wanted to make a project, make a book about social anxiety, about the way we are always thinking about the people around us and what they're doing and what their relationships are to each other and to you. Um, so this book is about that. And if you want to see these books, I have them down here, so I won't, you know, spend too much time uh, talking about them. Uh, but I, did, I do want to say one other thing, and that's that I use, you see some text here. There was only minimal text in this book. I did use a lot of punctuation that had, punctuation that um, indicates a relationship, uh, asterisks and ampersands and uh, things like that. I use a lot of reference text. Uh, I think that's appropriate for, for books. I, I think it's appropriate for the kind of books that I make. Um, this is a more recent book. I made it, I made it here, actually. Um, this, this book is, for me, about time, about shifting over time, and about the present moment, um, which I indicate with kind of a red spread obscures everything else. This, this system of shifting and changing that has a chronology through the book is completely masked when you get to this one central point. So it, again, things that are hidden, things that are um, revealed and seen. Um, also here, I made a series of prints that were similar, where I was printing on underlayers that are invisible if the, these prints are viewed traditionally. I think a lot of the people who ended up with these prints don't even really know that there's stuff stuff underneath printed. Some of it is blind stamped and there's no, uh, no, no evidence on the outside that there's something happening behind. But I like that idea of putting this work into a layer that no one is going to access or see. Here are some of the others. Um, so now it's the vacation slide portion of our uh, talk today. <laughs> um, I'm ready now to talk about this book. Um, but to talk about it, we have to go back because the book began years ago, um, maybe three years ago, when I was teaching in Italy, as Man Nancy, as Nancy mentioned. Uh, I was in uh, Cortona, which is in Tuscany. It was just so beautiful that it was almost 
gross, you know, everything was like glorious and the sun and the hills and everything else. Um, but it was a beautiful place and I think nothing makes you think about a, a new project, like a beautiful, new, different sort of place. Um, so here I am, this is like out of my apartment, by the way, you know, what a drag. Um, so, while I was there, I just started taking photographs of things that I found interesting. And in the beginning, I didn't know that there was a pattern until the end. And these aren't photos I was ever going to frame or show to anybody, but just to kind of have a, I'd put them in a file on my desktop and I'd keep them there and see what, what kind of shook out. And what it turned out is that I was obsessed with, and I think a lot of people are obsessed with, collections of things. The way that things sift together and then suddenly on a table you have like a pile of dental equipment for no good reason, you know. I, I just loved it. And what I think I found most interesting about it, and, and at the same time I should say in Alabama, I was living there, I was taking photos of scrap heaps that I would pass where people had organized all the metal by, you know, and I just thought, oh God, it's so delicious the way these piles are all the same color. And uh, I think it's about how great that these things are manufactured brand new in a place and they go out into the wide world and they're used and all kinds of things happen and then here we are at the end of their lives they end up together again on this table or in a museum or wherever they are just collected like like pebbles in the ocean floor find each other kind of these things find each other again and I thought that was just swell so I was taking um, these photographs at the same time, and there are many of you here who know a lot more about architecture than me, so I'm not going to even pretend to have a language to talk about this, but the other photographs I was taking were of um, these, these buildings who had windows where windows were no longer, these ghosts of, of uh, a facade that wasn't there anymore, and I thought that was pretty interesting, particularly in Pisa, where you know I hear there's a tower, but also there is this the, these buildings that have text, do you see text in them? That are taken and repurposed and put in a new place. The same thing happens with books, by the way. People use old books in spine linings, you'll find that sometimes, and boy, what a mystery. Well, what did that used to say? Now it's just a rock on the on a wall. I just oh, I thought that was great. There's another one. Look, TH. What? I don't know, but look at it. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. So these things, you know, going out, being reused in different ways, sometimes finding, you know, like things again. So what's, yeah. So I, I came back, uh, or I came here, and all of this stuff was kind of sifting around in my head. And, and so my way of proceeding is just to make things without thinking, you know, in the beginning. I do a lot of thinking, but that happens later. And I think Bruce Bennett in his talk last night, where's Bruce, um, was saying, you know, you just start writing. And it, I think it's true. It must be true for every single thing, you know. You just have to start, you know, and not have any expe expectation that this is going to be the thing. You just have to start and move. And so I started by thinking, I think I want to make a book with wheels in it, with vavels, with kind of the way you can turn a wheel. I, I bet all of you have seen them. You turn a wheel and different information becomes visible in different places. There's actually a great book that's been published, I don't know, within the last five years of nothing but vavels that don't move, unfortunately, but they shows you all of this, these great old, old calculation wheels and proportion wheels. My tendency when I make a book is always to do like a jobby, nightmare -y mess, meaning like lots of little holes and things that pull out, and I'm trying so hard not to do that now, but I always start there. And so this is the beginning of that, is this wheel. Now, I didn't know where it was going to go. I, I had, I liked the, the, the screw is probably something I found. It reminded me of the scrap heaps, or who knows? Who knows what that was about? But so I made a bunch of junk. Oh, look, here we are, and it's over there. In case you can't, in case you can't read it, um, I, I somehow, and I actually, honestly, I don't know how this happened. Moved from, uh, you know, just making a bunch of stuff to the periodic table, and I think sometimes it just happens that way, where everything <coughs> suddenly you're in the car and you're not thinking about anything, and you're like counting the number of cows you're driving by, and then suddenly you think. Oh! Periodic table, and it, there it was. Um, and I thought, what a great way to think about this idea of disseminating things and combining things and reusing them in a different way. This is like the eternal story of what I've been taking photographs of. And so 
that's kind of what brought me to the periodic table. Um, and uh, so I started playing around with the periodic table rather than playing around with little weird vavels. This is obviously, who knows what this is? I mean, I have made it, this is a digital file. I was playing in InDesign using old photographs and weird stuff, just seeing what fell out, you know. At the same time, I have to work three-dimensionally. I have to work in the book form. So I also got on the press and printed out some kind of weird periodic table form that I think is maybe even slightly wrong, but just, just to have it there, just to have a pile of periodic shaped things to then use as a raw material for cutting and folding and putting together. Um, so, so there it is. Just start making stuff. See, look, I'm being jobby. I'm like, oh, you know what would be great? Cutting a million holes for a hundred years. That would be the greatest thing I could possibly do with my life for my three years at Wells. But uh, I, so I started here. But I was thinking about, you know, obscuring certain elements, revealing certain elements, how you can take the table and have it say something else by, by hiding parts of it, how you can talk about what things are made of by using this one format and like, just kind of showing portions of it, like a peep show. Um, so that's about that. Um, here I am again, still more jobbiness, thinking, oh, what if I use one card, pull it out, I actually have it here. Let's see. Here it is. What if I have, you know, one card with the periodic table and I have like a child's board book, you know, and you slide it in and one page is the human and one page is your car and one page is your pair and the other pages, you know, who knows what. Still, it's like an arbitrary crazy book, but I was kind of getting closer to what I was thinking about. And it was at this point that I talked to uh, Christopher Bailey, who's sitting right there. Yay. Yay! Thank you, chemistry, for helping me to realize that I, yeah, there it is. And he was so nice to me. I hadn't really sat down with the periodic table since I was in 10th grade, and he was so patient, and he just, you know, we sat in front of it, and I had a little notebook, and I was writing down what he was saying, and I don't remember it now. I'm sorry. But, I <laughs> but what I learned, basically, is that things are made of too much stuff for that book. Things are made of too much stuff. The car, it's like I have to start thinking about what a bumper of a car is made of, and what the seats are. That's an impossible thing. That's crazy. I can't do that. And so I had to refocus um, that idea. And so how was I going to do that? Um, one thing that helps me along the process of making a book, and a book takes a couple of years, and boy, it's just slow to pay off. So it's nice to have smaller projects. Print, I do prints so that I can have something I can finish to feel good about during the process of making something a lot more complicated. So I started playing with the periodic table in, with prints, with more finished than these mock-ups, but not as finished as a book. This print was, I think, where I started to think about the human body specifically. Um, and also, it, it made me, it gave me a, a lens so that I could focus the book. You don't want to make a book that's just an arbitrary pile of stuff. You want to ha have a, a thought, you know, contribute something to what, you know, what you're making. So, I did a lot of kind of boneheaded online research about which elements or what the elements in the human body and what they do. You know, made a little key for myself. You can see it up at the top. What does it make? What is it like? Origin of the name. Just to help me sift through that, I put it all on index cards like you used to do when you were writing a research paper. And I laid it all on my floor and started to organize them by what they had in common. And I found that was, there's some pretty interesting stuff to me, like what is in pesticide is also in fertilizer, which kind of made me scratch my head a little bit, you know. Things that I thought were kind of interesting, things that seem to have contrary purposes being made of the same stuff. So, whew, I thought, um, that's the way I want to go. I want to think about the elements in the human body. I want to think about what else they do um, and what we do with them um, and how sometimes they are, it makes perfect sense and sometimes it's a mystery. And, I just wanted to think about that a little more, so I started to uh, lock myself in the third floor bindery in uh, Morgan with a big piece of newsprint, and there weren't any classes in there in that semester. So I just sat up there with my pen when I had a few hours and I wouldn't let myself leave, and I started to really design the book. 
So you can see this is the beginning of my thought. Here, this is actually my apartment. It all looks like this. It's like a crazy person lives there. The, uh, uh, you can see the very satisfying beginnings of something actually happening down at the bottom. Um, the thumbnails. These. That, I think, is a sign that you're finally going the right way. Because when you have something that you can organize, you know, then, then it's just a matter of moving forward. So, this is like, showing people this is kind of like, I don't know, showing people your bathroom a little bit, but the, I'm going to take you through the design of one spread. So this particular spread in the book, um, I knew, it, the pesticides fertilizer thing made me think a lot about medicines and weapons that we make. And so I thought it's interesting that the same stuff makes these two things. I wasn't thinking about it in a good and evil kind of way, just in a what, you know, how interesting. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. I'll think about that for a while. Um, and initially I was trying to organize them in groups, like putting poison gases together and putting, you know, antibiotics with antihistamines and antidepressants. I mean, it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't going quite the right way. But um, this is how I started. You can see that I was labeling the elements. Um, I should say that th this is maybe a bit of a jump, but I was identifying early in the book the elements in the human body with colored rectangles. So this wouldn't be the first spread you would see in the book. I'll show it all to you later so it's not a total uh, out of nowhere mystery. Um, that's, this is the nice like, oh, okay, that's better kind of moment. I, just, I shifted them together. Un actually, that was your suggestion, Chris, and it's a really good one. I wasn't thinking about it good and evil, but any person in the, u in the universe that was going to look at something with weapons on one side and guns on and medicine on the other side would see a good and evil page. You can see one thing I did want to change is that rocket propellant and laxatives are next to each other, which was, you know, that was like the first thing I, oh, you're not going to do that. Um, but at, at this point, I'm kind of mixing it up and um, just showing that the same elements are making these very different things. Um, those of you, how many of you are letterpress printers or have ever been? Can you show me generally? So, yeah, you are. So, uh, you know that printing two colors is like something that can happen in an afternoon. And printing 20 colors is like you're going to spend the rest of your life printing rectangles. And you better like it. And so I was really trying. I was like, I don't want to do this in 20 colors. I'm going to do it in two colors. It doesn't matter. No one will know. <laughs> It's not important that people identify these rectangles, but that's wrong. And I, I send, uh, I send my, my, I make mock-ups. In fact, I think there are, uh, well, there's some coming, but I make mock-ups and I send them away to people I trust. This is a little, you know, I'm kind of here by myself. Nancy's here, my students are here, a few people, you know, floating around, you know, um, but uh, the, the book people that I have forged connections with through grad school and stuff like that, I still send them my books to have some feedback so that it comes back to me um, with some, you know, with some thoughtful comments. And so, you know, my friend Jessica, who I hate now, said, you have to have 20 colors in your book. And I knew she was right. And I knew it, you know, so this, so it did end up being 20 colors. And I'll talk about selecting those colors in a minute. Um, here are some of the mock-ups. There must be 15. They're all in Morgan. I have a few of them here. Anyone who's interested in seeing like a million mock-ups, come on, come on by. Um, starting with the early design mock-ups, moving through mock-ups that I was making during the printing process to finalize the binding. Everything needs to be very carefully considered. Um, I'm going to buzz you through this quite quickly. This is the same process for a spread about elements in the crust of the earth that are also elements in the human body. Um, this looked a bit much like a record. I kind of got rid of the lines that I was trying to decide about the grid, keeping the periodic table there or not. You know, here the colors are back because of stupid Jessica. <laughs> um, and here's that spread at the end. Um, the, um, the design itself happened on InDesign. When, it, when I got down to it. Uh, so this, anyone who's familiar with InDesign or Quark, 
uh, is uh, this is you know a simple process of making lines and being very meticulous, but being just as meticulous in InDesign as you are on the press as you are in the bindery. This kind of stuff just takes a lot of patience, and uh, you have to like for example, if you 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 need to make sure or the distance is the same always between the words and the just the the precision which no one will come and congratulate you about, really. But they notice, even if they don't know they notice. It makes a huge difference to be deliberate about those choices. So, at this point, the design coming together, you know, slowly, surely. I'm sending away for plates. These, uh, this file here became this negative. I made, uh, or I actually had a friend of mine and Boxcar Press as well make Polymer plates for me. Polymer plates, for those of you who don't know, are a, uh, it's a photosensitive plastic material that hardens when exposed to light, and then you can use it as a relief printing surface. So it's a great way to make, um, to, to print from something you've designed on a computer, to go from digital to this very basic kind of printing process. Basic in a lovely way, not a, not a bonehead way. Um, so this is that file, organized. Uh, just into black and white and for cost effectiveness because making plates is expensive everything is expensive paper particularly is expensive and when you're dealing in an edition of 75 the raw materials can get to be you know in the neighborhood of maybe two thousand dollars so it's something that you have to put in a lot in the beginning and hopefully <laughs> hopefully reap the reward at the end but otherwise you're just in a hole um, I don't like to think about the whole, I mostly just move forward like I've got my hands over my eyes. Um, and now it's printing time. These gentlemen are here to show you the Vandercook Press and the, the beautiful, beautiful Book Art Center has seven lovely presses. Um, the, uh, the next slide doesn't work, but I want you to know I went to the trouble of having a little video to show you how it worked for those of you who don't know but it doesn't work. <laughs> but it works something like this. You crank, the paper goes over, and it, and it presses against, and then you've got a thing, and it's all very exciting. You'll just have to take my word for it. I'll teach you how to do it if you come over. Um, see that rectangle? That was an entire day in <laughs> April, maybe, of last year. That was red rectangle day. I put it on Facebook. There it is. Hey, buddy. You're a red rectangle. You took all day. There's another one. Oh. Hello. Ah, yellow rectangle day. Exciting. These two days, it was still fun then. Blue day, I was uninterested. And that was when I started to hate Jessica Peterson. That is her name. Do not send her a book and ask her to give you good ideas. That took longer than it seems to. There. This is like, I don't know, two months of nothing but rectangles. Nancy was there. A lot of you were there looking at that. That was an awful situation. Anyway, this is printing the book. I'm going on. I'm going rogue. Just ignore me. I'm going to keep going. This is uh, the map I had to make for myself about which color was going to be on which spread. Most of the spreads had 20 colors at least. Every color takes a couple of hours. You know, some spreads had more, some had a few less, but you know, you need to have some kind of system where you're, 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 you're never going to know what you're doing. Um, I want to just quickly take you through the process of printing one page, this page, kind of a weird page, uh, because I was not only printing uh, in a traditional kind of relief process, but I was also pressure printing at the same time. For those of you who are in my Art on the Press class or, you know, have done pressure printing, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm mixing some ink here, very exciting. Also, I want to talk very briefly and just say that the colors in the book uh, were Every color, I guess you figured it out, every color is identifying a specific element, starting with primary colors for the three most common elements in the human body, and then secondary colors, and then kind of onward and through. Um, there's polymer plate, and there is a very, very faint gray um, print from that plate. That was, that was from the ink up there. So there we go. Um, now I'm making a plate, a pressure plate, which is going to go behind the paper. 
Um, I'm sticking it onto the press there. Uh, and it's only going to print where uh, one of those white blobs comes into contact with the relief surface below. So there. Those green circles are the only spots where those two processes kind of came together. Making another plate, the great thing about pressure plates is that they're, there's no left-right reversal, so you can plan right on top of what you're doing. And there's, a, there's the second run. I think I used a different plate there. Inked it up in orange. There's some orange blobs. I'm a blob fan. I like blobs. There's the, the um, polymer plate again. Some more blobs. Why not? Let's just blob it up. There's some more blobs on there. <laughs> Um, and uh, why don't I do some just blank blobs? Okay, let's do that. I liked, I wanted to have a, at least one folio that was st still kind of, you know, a, a part of the periodic table, but also kind of bubbling and boiling and organic and weird. And um, so I, I, uh, I printed this one. And then black ink for the page number. So unsatisfying <laughs> to do all of that inking up, and it takes so long to clean black off the press just for a little number nine. Hey, number nine. There we go. So that's that folio. And there it is, printed, completely, finished, months of work. Um, I'm going to buzz you through the book just so you can see what all that was about. Here is, um, the, I'm going to read you the list of diagrams, which I guess maybe you can read. They are, um, you are what you are made of. You are part of something larger than yourself. There's you are what you're made of. You're part of so something larger than yourself. You are what you stand on, which is that's the crust of the earth there. You are what you make, which is part one. You are what you make, part two. These are building materials, tools, pigments, different, different things. You are what is similar to you. This is just a list of tons of animals. There's a lot of great animal names, by the way. Um, you are where you came from. And this is the proportion of the, these elements in seawater. Um, you are and you are. And that's the end. Um, the binding, I'm not, I won't go through a, a hundred things to talk to you about that, but it's bound as a, as a drum leaf for those of you who know what that is. And, just a lot of slow steps, applying spine linings, making um, spines for the outside of the book. See those little orange corners? That's just a little detail so that there's no exposed board. My finding two students know about that. Um, putting the covers on, making boxes, because you can't make a white book and not put it in a box. You need to just do the librarians a solid, because otherwise you're basically giving them something that they're going to, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't do it. I made a box. There it is. There's some boxes. That's my apartment. Hey. That's me making a fancy box, because I also made a deluxe edition for this book. And here it is. Finished. Finished. Hey, hey. There are those corners. This is, I don't usually do this, but I did make a deluxe edition of ten for this book because there were prints I thought it would be nice to at least for ten copies have them housed together the way that they were printed so the first ten copies of the book uh, are, are together with all with all of the prints. I did an edition of prints simultaneously with the, with the book is what I'm trying to articulate. Oh! Hey guys! Hey! That's the, this is the end of the biography you know story um, I just want to say very briefly um, a few other things uh, that have been going on. One is that we produced Bruce Bennett's book, um, Bestial Floor, in the Book Arts Center um, with Alex Schloop and, and Abby Williams as interns. Um, we printed it, designed it, housed it in a box, handmade boxes, and it's been a really fun um, project to be working on this year. So thank you, you guys, you know, all of you. I wish Abby could be here, she's not, but to Bruce and, and uh, Alex, you guys are here. Um, here they are, look at that, putting some 
putting some sheets into a box there. A lot of excitement happening in the Book Arts Center these days. Uh, and here it is, brand new. We just had the reading last night. Bruce was, uh, was great, and, uh, and it's all finished. Um, and just to very quickly talk about what I'm working on now, um, you can see this is the baby steps for a new project using the 2005 economic census. I'm working with a friend of mine, David Allen, who is a theoretical ecologist, which I love to say and don't entirely understand, but he's, he's, a, he's a great guy who knows how to deal with raw data. So we're working together uh, with just these raw numbers from the economic census, county level data for something like 75 variables and we're kind of working to pair them and make kind of ellipses that are representative of relationships between variables. Relationships that don't actually exist. So this is what we're doing now. This is not to say this is what the book is going to be, but this is our kind of process of play for working on this project. And I just produced my first print as a, the same thing. I did a periodic table print for the, for the periodic table book, and now I've done this, this print. Um, uh, for this book, so I'm just starting the whole process all over again. I think that's it? Yes, that's it. So. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when you have the lines that are going from one thing to another, mm -hmm. They're faint on the screen, yes. and they seem to bifurcate. And I just, uh, in other words, it isn't a single one to one. Does no. it? Uh, does it then spread out to from one thing to maybe three or four? Yeah. Let's see. Let me um, actually. Let me see if I can go and find one. The the um, the lines um, here, for example, these lines yeah. and yeah. these lines. The, the lines actually do, the, the elements that I found that were kind of major ingredients in these various tools or weapons or whatever, um, the lines go from the element identified by color straight to that, uh, that thing, that object or whatever, whatever it may be. And this in here, it's actually going off the page. I'm trying to, I'm kind of slowly making these diagrams more illegible. It's not, this is certainly no one is going to be going to this book to do any scientific research. But I was, you know, <laughs> at least I hope not. Don't do it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they're, I, paint, I printed them in a faint gray because I, in the end to me, what was most important were the colors of the elements and the black text of the things we make of them, or the things we are kind of becoming, you know, later. Um, does that answer that question? Yes. Um, I'm struck by the beautiful photographs um, all along of the whole process. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if um, first of all, did, did you take all the photographs, and whether this is a common aspect uh, making books to, to do that, but to you have a photographic record of all the signatures. I don't know if other people do it. I, it, it takes so long to uh, start to go from design to completion that I like to have a record because I honestly sometimes I'll forget. I forgot all about the Vavels. I forgot all about the collections of things in Italy. I forget about everything, but I do like to at the end of a project gather it together and look at the narrative. And normally I don't actually go around and say, you know, here, yeah, look at my narrative, but, you know, today. <laughs> but I do, it helps me to kind of focus, you know, at the end, you know, to, to be able to articulate to myself, okay. It's so easy to go off the rails. You know, you're making a book about one thing and then you end up making, a, I don't know, something else or sometimes badly, you know, it's, it helps to keep you focused to keep a record of what you're doing. And sometimes I'll even write in the design, I'll write things to myself big, like you are not doing a chemistry book, you know, <laughs> you are not, you know, do not make this more complicated, no jobbiness, don't make anything pull out of anything else, you know, just, you know, I, I kind of like the photographs and my notes to myself just keep me directed. 
Um, I think I think it's t it's a temptation to take photographs of the process, though, because it's such a part of your life. You know, it's like some people take photographs of their dogs or their lives. <laughs> yeah, here it is. You know. <laughs> Any other questions? Sarah, would you comment on the title of the book? Yeah. Yes. Biography, which it's kind of a, a bit of a play playfulness, but I do think it's a biography. You know, it's the story of what is inside of us. It's our story. Um, it's also, you know, a, a, you know, you have the bio um, prefix and the the mapping, you know, graphing. I just think it suited the content pretty well. So it was one of the rare times actually that I knew the name relatively close. Everything is called something else, like in my head, the skeleton book, the people book, the, you know, whatever it is. But this one was by, it was the periodic table book, but it was also biography pretty early, once I knew kind of the bones of what I was doing. Yes? Sarah, might we ask the chemistry professor if you knew which play he was getting into? Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> marketing of a book like this? I yes. know you know collectors, but how do people that don't know about this find out? When I, uh, when I print a book, um, first of all, I, I do have a dealer who specializes in artist books, and that is, boy, such a help, because they have access to, and the resources to go from, I mean, I could fly all over the country meeting with special collections librarians and not make a dime, because I'm traveling everywhere to, to do that. So Bill and Vicki Stewart, who are uh, the Vamp and Tramp booksellers, uh, they do a lot of my selling for me. And they also know kind of where my books will find a home. They kind of know where they'll go. So I've made a lot of my sales through them. So they're like an agent. Yeah. But they, they, they also deal in books, not artists. So they, you know, they'll, they'll take a book. Um, yeah, they, they kind of go book by book. But they've represented a lot of the books that I've done. But I also, you know, they're in shows. They show um, a lot and in different places. And every now and then I'll go to a conference and be there as, it's Big Jump Press, by the way. That's my, you won't, if you Google Sarah Bryant, you'll find a video game character and, an, and a British woman who died fighting <laughs> in Iraq. So don't Google me. But if you Google Big Jump Press, this, this, is, what, this is what I am. So I, I'll go to an event or, you know, and represent my, my work there. And so I sell things that way, too. Um, would you say that this is the most elaborate book that you've ever done? It has the most colors in it, you know, but that's for sure, you know. But the binding is actually less complicated than others, and I feel proud of that. You know, there's still something that goes, woo, and there's still boxes in it. But, but uh, I feel like at least now I'm, I don't know, I, li I like... I like this better than all the finicky jobby card pulling outy kind of business, which is more elaborate. But the printing was those are complicated. I don't know, they're all they're all big messes, you know, and I hate them halfway through, but I like them now. Yes. What initially drew you to the book as an art form and why you keep making books? I think I'm gonna have to think a little more. You know, when I was in college, I was, I didn't know anything about book art, and I didn't take any printmaking courses, which is such a shame, and um, I was still interested in books, you know, and I was trying to make weird, bad, terrible books. I worked for a book designer out of college, and that was such a revolution, just taking things, taking like a box of photographs with like grease pencil on them, and a box of, you know, word files printed out and an index and, and just putting it all together and having a book at the end. Whoa! I wasn't printing that book, but even just putting the raw materials together was great. And I also think I've always been drawn to, even though I spent my undergraduate time making uh, terrible paintings, I've been drawn to editions. You know, so every time I've ever made a thing, you know, before I found like books and, and uh, printing and having a printing press. Every time I've made a thing, I've always been disappointed at the end because it wasn't 20 identical things. Like, it didn't count unless you do it in at least an edition of 20. So I think there's just little parts of me that made it all kind of make sense. And so once I figured out that this was something you could do, it, it just made sense, so I do it now. I also think that, I don't know, people might disagree with me, but I don't think you can make um, a I don't think you can make artist books without having the, the project be about the book. 
you know, you're always going to be making work about the book. I mean, I'm kind of obviously making work about the book because I'm making work that has reference materials in it and, you know, titles and things like that. But even if you're making a book that you think is about something else, I think you're still working in book form. And that means you find something in the book form that you think is worthy to talk about. And whether that means you're presenting a sequence, you know, you're actually giving people, you're guiding them through something in a really prepared, you know, deliberate way. It's always about the book. You're always making work about the book. That was not an answer to your question, but I, I just answered something else just for kicks. Yes? When you went to Alabama and started the NFA program, how much printing had you had? Oh, I just hadn't done any printing. I mean, no, no printing. I had done a lot of print inkjet, you know, reproductions of drawings and like all of this stuff that seems now, like all of the mock-ups that I've ever made, that's kind of the stuff I was doing, but I had never done any printing. And I, I wasn't even thinking about printing when I had done it, which is crazy. Now. So when our students go to Alabama or another graduate program, how are they prepared compared to how you were prepared? Well, I mean, what's the difference between zero and a, and a million, I think? <laughs> I mean, they know they're completely prepared. Yeah. yeah. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Can you please go back to the blobs? Yeah. Oh, it's like you're asking me to do my favorite thing. <laughs> blobs, for sure. Oops. My colleague today in class, I don't remember who it was, but I remember she was a girl. She was <laughs> saying, "Were you aiming that you were? Uh, were you aiming to uh, like draw Easter eggs?" No. <laughs> No, but I think, you know, there's some, I, I, in my, they're kind of, I think of them like s cells or, it's not important to me that other people see what I was seeing, but I, I just was aiming to have an organic shape. You know, you've got this grid that's kind of unforgiving for pages and pages, and I just wanted to have something, I think we connect to the blobs a little, even though we created the grid, I think we connect to the blobs. And but so don't I, you think eggs are organic? Too? They are. No, they are. Absolutely. You see eggs, I see, I see blobs and cells, and, but I think it's the same. I think we're seeing the same sort of thing. Definitely. Yes? Can you say something about your relationship to, to technology in terms of how you move between analog mechanical ways of producing versus digital both production and Design. Yeah, um, I will try. I basically uh, see the letterpress as a tool, the way a pen is a tool, or a pencil is a tool, and a computer is a tool. All of these things are tools, and I use them all. And I don't necessarily need to print letterpress. This book, woo, 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 um, here. That's not a letterpress printed book. The spread, the red spread is a letterpress printed portion because I could do it that way. It's a lino cut. It's easy for me to do that rather than, but I took that batch to Kinko's and boy did I feel weird about that. And then I walked out with this box of stuff that was printed and I felt like a bank robber, you know. <laughs> but, but to me, for this book, the process of printing the A's and B's, which is what those are, wasn't, it wasn't important. Um, to me, what's important is the execution of an idea. And I like using letterpress uh, and printing that way because I'm in control of every single thing. You know, it's a simple machine. I can mix my ink. I can design the thing. I can digitally design. I can carve a block. I, there are a million ways for me to use this machine to do what I want. But also, it's a limitation, and I like having a limitation. I like being able to work with a set of rules that I can find ways around, but I'm, I'm working within a set of restrictions that I think makes me more creative rather than, you know, less. Does that answer your question? Good. Be quiet. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, I have some books here and some mock-ups. Anybody wants to come and have a look, you're welcome to. Morgan Hall is also full of mock-ups and books and, and prints. And uh, I'd love for you guys to stop by. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>